Yes, hello. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers. This is a fascinating event. I've had such a great time listening to some of the speakers, all of the speakers whom I listened. Uh, very inspiring uh, conversations, very inspiring ideas. Uh, what I'll try to tell, explain today is about uh, our startup or scale up, uh, how we make money with AI. Uh, how we make money for our customers and how we make money for ourselves by deploying a very specific layer of AI for a very specific use case, which we call next best action. So I'll first tell you the first five slides. I will tell you who we are. Just high level. I'll, I'll show you a bit of recognition that we got globally. So and then after these first five slides, I'll unwrap a little bit how our MLOps look like how we are actually doing data engineering, how are we training the models, the performance of the models, and how is this being deployed. So this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. So first, a little bit about ourselves. So I have three slides telling you how great we are. Okay. <laughs> Self-promotion. So Kiwi Tech is a, a global accelerator based in New York. It was a competition in 2021. More than 400 global scale-ups applied. We won <laughs> and got quite substantial sponsorship from them, including uh, them supporting our VC funding uh, round and also development. Then this is in Budapest, also 21, uh, OTP Bank for the entire group. There was a big contest of scale-ups with uh, application to fintech. We won again <laughs> uh, among, again, more than 500 global fintechs. 220 were selected for uh, uh, demo uh, pilot projects. They presented, and again, we won. And this is recent. Uh, it was it is from, from a publication in August 22, so one and a half months ago, where a quote, I will, I will not quote, you can read, a leading data analytics and machine learning technology company for what this specific vertical, which is uh, life sciences, pharma, sales and marketing. This is our specific vertical on which we focus. Again, we, we did not pay for this. I mean, you can easily obtain such a quote if you pay for this, but this is an independent <laughs> paper, not published by us, not written by us, not, not paid by us in one of the leading global publications in this field. So, what do we do? Uh, very simple. Well, we help companies in two verticals. I already mentioned life sciences, pharma, and banking. In these two very narrow verticals, for so two very narrow use cases, we are trying to build the best uh, deployment of AI we can. And I'll explain how we do it. What we do, we personalize message timing and channel in communications. Uh, so, as I said, two B2B verticals driven by true AI. There are many use cases where, where fintechs or companies say this is AI, but it's actually much simpler technology. I will show you really the layer of AI machine learning as a service layer which we deploy. And, and we are proud to really be, already be scaling our technology. So this is the map of our customers uh, on three continents. Uh, our headquarters is well, in Cambridge, the place to be, as Peter and a few other speakers have confirmed. Uh, very proud to have headquartered there. Uh, most of our team in Zagreb, part of our team is also in Skopje, if not Macedonia. So this is where we find talent. Uh, and uh, this is actually where we operate. Uh, and I'll show you examples from our actual deployments from actual customers whom we serve. Okay. One more slide, introduction. Let me show you exactly what we do. So, you can't see much, <laughs> but I'll tell you what is on the screen. First, let me tell you, it's not our UI, it's not our design, it's Salesforce. We are sending data to Salesforce, and this is their color scheme, which we hate, uh, but what can we do? So, uh, this is deployed by one of the leading global uh, pharma companies, Novartis is number three, very close to number two. Without COVID, it would be number one, because Pfizer, of course, is number one due to, due to vaccine sales. It's deployed globally for their 
three most profitable brands in their biggest markets, some of their biggest markets. So it's not a proof of concept, it's deployed in production. Their sales reps, so as, as you may know, pharma companies spend more than 50% of their budget on sales, unfortunately, not on R&D, uh, not on uh, development, not on actually manufacturing drugs, it sells, it spends more than 50% of the budget on sales and marketing. They have to do it ethically. It's a big topic how they do it. They have to do it ethically. But still, it's their focus. They have very, very large sales force teams in each of the markets, actually going around visiting healthcare professionals and uh, promoting with ethics, with integrity, promoting their uh, products. So, so I'm talking about a few brands, all of them are three brands, all of them are on the list of top 20 to 30 most profitable pharma brands globally, which we are supporting for this company. And what, we, what does our engine do? So each sales rep gets on his or her iPad through Salesforce a recommendation, which channel, which message, which slide from a presentation they have on their iPad, uh, which timing, uh, they get precise instructions, which next best, whom they need to visit, how, which email they need to send. So this is the next best action. Uh, and this, all this data is calculated by our platform, sent to their Salesforce, displayed on their iPads, and this is what they, they do. And when they do it, pharma companies who deploy it in A-B tests earn 20 to 30% more as compared to when they don't. So I'll show you results from A-B tests why this technology is actually making money. Our second vertical, actually, we should probably focus on only one. This is what we see us telling us. You should do only one thing. But we do two things reasonably well, and we don't, cannot decide. So we still continue trying to do both things with two separate teams with many synergies. So this is the second use case. This is an example for some South Africa. This is banking. Okay? This is uh, the, one of the biggest African banks, Nedbank, operating in South Africa with their digital app. What they have done is completely insane. They created a digital app, which is up for everything. This is how they brand it. It's called AWO. Why? They are selling products like our phone and then combining it with their financing products. This is the way they grow. They're merging uh, banking products with real uh, things like you can see MacBook Air. So what you can't, can't see here, but if you I mean, if you could see the small print, it says, Hi, Vinko, we have a limited offer for you. So it's a notification appearing on your iPhone or Android or on your screen, which is actually leading you to the app. Uh, and this is, again, personalized channel message timing for the second vertical for banking. So these are two verticals we keep scaling with two different teams with many, many things overlay, uh, with actually the entire MLOps infrastructure being up to a certain extent common, but with many, many different things, so I'll explain. And here we are coming to the common theme of quite a few presentations uh, we'll listen to, which is that uh, uh, combination of AI and human thinking. Peter, thank you for, for this, this really powerful theme. Uh, also, emphasis on feature engineering, emphasis on AI not being a black box, but emphasis on actually doing lots and lots of hard work in preparing data prior to actually giving it to the models. So here's how our MLOps, how our platform, our platform is entirely in cloud, in AWS. It's uh, really uh, just a layer of three big components. The first is analytical data lake. The second one is automated, up to a certain extent, AI. And the third component is deployment and integration. And then I'll now, coming to the second part of the talk, unwrapping what we do and showing you a bit of the secrets, uh, some of the secrets, <laughs> why our uh, technology is performing as well as it is performing. And I'll show you some results from A-B tests, how much of the impact we have. So let me first uh, go into analytical data lake. This is, I have to say, 80% of our investment, 80% of our commitment, of our work. 
As I said, there are two verticals. Let me show you life sciences and pharma. The first key takeaway is that we actually inject many, many different data sources for this specific use case with bespoke connectors, integrators for this use case. We did not ask our customers to give us data. We built the data platform ourselves. The only thing we get from our customers is this. This is from CRM. This is Viva or Salesforce. This is the typical 95% of large pharma companies use Viva for their Salesforce management, which is an add-on on uh, Viva, which is an add-on on Salesforce. This is the technology that is used for this use case. However, we inject tons of other content. For example, Twitter. It's not scraping. We connect with API every morning, 3 a.m. to Twitter. Say, hello, good morning, we are Kantapai. Here's a list of handles. Please, can you share with us all the recent conversations, likes, and so on, from this list of handles? So it's one specific integrator with a small dedicated team maintaining only this. And here, there is a layer of AI used for matching of Twitter handles to all the other data in CRM, which is very, very, very unique and sophisticated. The second source for this data is PubMed. This is the public database of scientific papers in life sciences. We connect through API, which, by the way, broke down a couple of months ago, and they need to issue a new release in a couple of months. So we are driving pod blind and hoping that, that uh, PubMed will repair it. But in any case, this is also a dedicated API with also a layer of AI. Why? Because PubMed is not a well-organized database. With some issues, the same person can appear in PubMed with different names for different papers, and it's part of the headache to make sure this works. So, what I'm trying to say, uh, huge amount of work goes into maintaining this data picture. This is most of our work. AI, training of AI on top of it is relatively simple, relatively trivial. And uh, when our customers, if you go to a large pharma company, all of them will tell you, oh, we are planning to have a unified data model once in the future. And then we come and tell them, look, but we already have it, you can use it. It's a game changer. It's a huge, huge winning point, huge winning point. And, and the ability to actually build a unified customer digital profile, which is connecting in a meaningful way all the data points from different data sources, this is where, where, where the magic is starting to happen. This is the difficult part. This is what human understanding of what's going on is entering into the story prior to deploying AI. There is an important big component, marketing content. We have built another layer which is actually trying to understand what these people are discussing in all these different channels and categorizing it in a systematic way. In pharma, typically, you can, you can communicate that your brand is so-called efficacy or quality of life or safety. These are typical messages. Different customers react differently to different kinds of messages. We are tracking across all the channels and trying to figure out what is engaging a specific customer. This requires very deep contextual understanding translated into data engineering of what they are discussing for a specific brand. And without it, we would be blind. Now, once we have integrated it, some of the people working in, 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 uh, sitting here in the room are really proud of the team and uh, great effort put into just this picture. What do we do after we've uh, injected all this data? This is the second part of our IP, how we organize data prior to training. Now, we have a dedicated team for maintaining data model. And what I'm going to show you, there are many, many hours, days, and weeks of heated discussions how this should look like. This is critical. We learned some of it from our friends, also in Zagreb, great company called Cintio. Maybe some of you have, have, learned, have, have, have heard of them. One of the fastest growing companies in Europe for data engineering. We uh, are good friends. We learned some of the things from them, and then we uh, made them more specific for use cases. So we organize our data in four layers. The first one is landing zone. We standardize input. From, for all different, from all different sources, so that it always looks the same. So it's standardization. Data cleaning is here. 
The second point is common data layer. Here, we ensure that, there, that we have single source of truth. What does this mean? In some cases, in this input, there are missing rows, there is missing data. As you know, imputation is important and non-trivial in many applications. We so make sure that this imputation is done always in the same way. So this is step two. Step three is, step three is feature generation. For, for every of two verticals, we have our specific IP, which features we consider important. This is our key secret here. This is the third step. And the fourth layer is actually use case layers for models deployment integration. So we have code which runs in AWS, which transforms data from one layer to the other layer every day, every hour, every minute in a standardized way. And we have dedicated data team which is policing, maintaining, and improving this data model. I'll show you how this data model, uh, what the implications are on actual deployment and on, at the end of the day, bottom line in cash. Okay. This all runs on AWS and uh, happy to, and the team who's standing uh, at our desk is happy to, to show more detail, tell you more details. Uh, uh, we are actually using, for people who are interested in it, we're combining both Python and R as technology and using all kinds of, uh, of course, Spark and all kinds of AWS tools to make sure this data lake actually is scheduled and runs in a rather automated way together with all kinds of AI models. And now the difficult work has been done. <laughs> now the fun starts. So how do we build the models? There's not much I'm going to tell you. It's almost uh, the easy part. I mean, once you have the data, you deploy the models. But I want to share two messages with you. The first one is, uh, yes, we have built a bespoke auto ML platform, which is simplifying up to a certain extent training. Uh, the message I want to share with you is uh, that also uh, there are all kinds of auto ML offerings in the market. There is data, robot, H2O, and so on. Uh, what we have done, we have, we have customized models, and for each use case there is a specific model, which we have heavily customized models for our use cases. So we learned that there is very little of the shelf you can use, that really for every single use case, you need to invest a lot into data engineering and into adapting technology so that it works for this specific use case. Uh, the second thing which I'm go uh, going to show you is actually how these models work. And for me, this is fascinating, how predictab predictable people are, <laughs> especially people in, in these two verticals, perhaps healthcare professionals the most. Uh, I don't know, I sometimes speculate healthcare professionals, doctors are used to follow certain templates when they make clinical decisions. It seems, it seems that they're following certain templates where they're making decisions like, am I going to click on a certain email or not? So, we have, for our uh, platform, we have built a classification models for each of the channels, which are predicting likelihood of engagement. And then, uh, our platform is recommending in a certain moment the action which has the highest likelihood of engagement. The simplest way to explain it is likelihood of engagement for an email. It's not an effective channel, as you, as you probably know for marketers. It's, it's probably the least effective channel, but the easiest to model. So I'm going to show you results for, for, for emails. So these are actual results from deployment for likelihood to engage, likelihood to click on an email, on a test sample. I repeat, you get to take an email and you're trying to predict if a specific customer at a specific time for a specific template is going to click on this email or not. And this is, this is the models, typical quali uh, production level quality of the models, which for expert Genie 61, uh, the way I explain it to myself, we explain 61% of the entire phenomena, the remaining 39% is white noise or things which we do not, but this is huge. This is huge. Uh, in, in this type of applications, this is sky high. We can really optimize to whom you send emails when and, and completely, almost completely eliminate spamming. I mean, prior to, to uh, uh, sales reps starting to use our, uh, our technology, what they would do? 
they will get for marketing the template which they need to send this month, and they will send this template the first Friday in a month to everybody. And then one of the things you would see immediately is how opt-out, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, the, the people can opt-out on receiving emails, marketing emails, and you can really see these opt-outs being substantial. And the moment they start deploying our technology, the click rate uh, goes up by three, four percent, uh, three, four times, and opt-outs completely stop. So this is a typical, almost quick win, but this applies to all the channels, and this is, this is why this thing works. Now, let me show you how this actually all comes together. I'll show you historical progression of quality of our likelihood to click. So this is Genie, which is maybe not the best, but for me, the easiest to explain, because there is a very simple interpretation percentage of phenomena that you explain with your AI. Uh, we started with off-the-shelf feature generator for the data set and with off-the-shelf selection of models from, from random trees to, to simple neural networks, and we got Gini 12.5. Nothing to, not much money in it, to be frank. <laughs> you can a little bit impact click rates and a bit reduce spamming and a little bit increase engagement, but doesn't really have that big of an impact. But then we said, okay, let's then make features which are really relevant for this use case. Not of the shell feature generator features, some of the features which are really relevant for this use case. For example, did this sales rep call the HCP within three days of sending an email? Sounds obvious. But this is an example of a feature, because if you call and say, look, I've just sent you an email, perhaps you, you, you should look uh, and, and see if this, is, uh, if, if this is interesting. Then we labeled complexity of an email and realized that this complexity is a big predictor. We labeled how many URLs you have in the email, because two complex emails are typically less engaging. We introduced all kinds of human insights into features, and then uh, suddenly we started seeing better. Gini 38.8. Here, we, as mentioned, we added content labeling, what this email is about, and started tracking it through the past. 44.3. Here we added two external data sources, Twitter and PubMed, and started tracking engagement of the people in different channels and tracking influences, which are also translated into features. 47.6. Uh, we added two internal data sources. What they do on web, because each company has its own uh, website, and what these customers do on web. 53.5. And here, this is the latest, what we call deep content labeling. We added a layer of contextual understanding of conversations. And suddenly, you really can predict pretty well what this customer is going to do. Deployment. So, we have a selection of tools which monitor our AI models, but there is one key message I want to share, why what we do really delivers. We are monitoring first and foremost business impact, and then uh, as secondary KPI, we monitor how well AI models are performing. So, uh, the first thing we monitor, we monitor actually sales. We, every time our customer gets new sales data, we inject it, and we have internal KPIs, and we monitor how much really did we move the needle in terms of bottom line. This is the first thing we look at. Then we look at engagement. Have we impacted click rates? Have we impacted conversions to web? Have we really moved the needle in terms of customers really engaging on this messaging? And only then we monitor how well the models are performing with typical standard uh, tools, which monitor uh, if an AI in time is losing its accuracy because there are some changes in distribution of data uh, and so on. For example, uh, we immediately saw when uh, first Apple and then Android, uh, again going back to email use case, where they introduced limitations to tracking of opening of an email. The marketers probably know about that. 
you cannot anymore track on iPhones, on Android. It's not reliable anymore. This data point has somebody opened an email because these hidden pixels are not really shared anymore. So, and we immediately realized that one of the, of the predictors, one of the features which is related to historical open rates is suddenly losing, losing precision. We immediately have seen the drift. But again, this is secondary. This is what we monitor. This triggers retraining of the models, all the usual stuff in MLOps. But I want to say we are not monitoring only, uh, we are not monitoring only uh, performance of the models in terms of AI accuracy, in terms of importance of features. We monitor business impact. And we discuss weekly in our weekly calls with our partners, which is not IT, which is not digital. It's typically sales and marketing. We discuss with them performance of these KPIs with them. So, uh, what is the beauty is that actually once you have done all the work, you can scale use cases. And uh, I'm not going to go through it much longer, but I want to say each of these two platforms is actually supporting more than one use case with rather minimal effort once you have organized the data and, and, and make sure that this data model is maintained and, and well structured. But I want to what, what I want to show you is actually what uh, our customers are seeing. Why is this making money for our customers? Why this is making money for ourselves? So, one of the first things we do when we deploy our uh, technology is say, okay, we, we are committing to a certain impact to sales, and please feel free to measure us in well defined, statistically significant A B tests. And this is what they do. And uh, very quickly, in terms of weeks, they see impact on engagement. Within a couple of months, they see impact of sa on sales. So this is a very recent result. After four months, 3% increase of sales. This is huge. Remember, it's one of the big, it's, it's actually from Spain. Uh, this is one of the biggest markets for one of the biggest pharma company for one, one of the most profitable. This is the most profitable brand for this company. This is huge money. After four months, in control group, which is 20% of sales reps compared to the remaining 80% representative control groups. So basically, they have done a little equivalent to a clinical trial, verifying if what we do is really delivering. 30% increase of sales growth, similar A-B test. And again, uh, this is the least we achieved, two and a half increase in click rates is the simplest KPI to measure, but very often three to four times. So, uh, again, this is the last slide I have, but I want to, <laughs> I want to summarize again the same, the same underlying theme. The key to a successful AI, which delivers impact, which delivers results, which moves the needle, is really a combination of human uh, understanding, deep contextual understanding of the use case and technology. Just deploying technology will give you very little. You have to invest a lot in understanding, deep contextual understanding. Let me just say, the brands which, support, which we support, there is one person in our team which knows as much about clinical trials, about uh, uh, how sales and marketing pharma works, as anybody in, in our customer company. This is, this is a must. And only then, you can prepare data, do data engineering, and deploy AI to have real-world impact. And now I'm going to say yeah, thank you. <laughs>